What are we starting with this we week? This, review- this, 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 oh. this. The, the, you wrote it out. This. You wrote it down. So even when I beat you, you wrote it in advance. <laughs> no, you guys are no, you're wrong. We're gonna start with a thanks to our patrons who supported uh, and paid for this episode. Uh, <laughs> gotcha! He duped us. God damn it. <laughs> yeah, just a thanks to our patrons over at patreon.com forward slash side guys for supporting the show. <laughs> Sorry, I can't believe how well that worked. Look, you I'll wrote it. I'll never let down. this go. I'll never let this go. I was so ready. The one week I win. <laughs> our patrons have voted for the topic of this episode, and also they're just lovely people. Why don't you go and become that's one? That's true. It's be lovely. Yeah, quite lovely. Shall we start the show? Let's start the show. Let's start the show. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-hosts, Jamp and Luke Cutford. That's me. Why, hello there. This week, we're talking about Nelson Mandela and some bears. Right. <laughs> Did he ever you know, fight Corey, a bear? <laughs> <laughs> I was starting to think, you know, when, I was, when we were away for the break, I, was, I watched the latest episode that we've just put up, and I thought, maybe we should start introducing a thing where Jamp and I try and guess the topic when you say this weird, cryptic crap you start the show with. But actually, with that, I'm going to go back on that. I have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> I think if you go back to the first episode, I think you guys did guess the topics. And so I just started making it harder and weirder. Oh, no, why? Yeah, there was a turning point somewhere. <laughs> it just became nonsensical. <laughs> it did, it did. But that's okay. So the death of Nelson Mandela um, and a 90s genie movie and the Berenstain Bears are all things that have been collectively <gasps> yes! misremembered yes! by a chunk oh, of the population. Yes! This was a oh. massive thing online. It was, yeah. I so, bet like 80% of our listeners got it and we were just there like, ooh, did he fight a bear? <laughs> I mean, they can, they can see the title of the episode, so I'm sure they definitely... Oh, true. I should have looked at the title of the episode. Really, <laughs> you should have done, shouldn't you? Ooh, I love how bear. Jam just used an, the example of thinking Nelson Mandela fought a bear as an example of someone being an idiot when that's the thing that he suggested. <laughs> <laughs> Silly. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know what we were talking about today then, I assume? The Mandela Effect. The Mandela Effect. That's I right, assume. yeah. Our, pa- uh, yeah, our parents, our patrons this month <laughs> have voted for Oh, they voted for this, did they? Of course they voted for this. <laughs> of course they voted for this. They voted for the science of false memories and the Mandela Effect. So, that is what we're going to be doing. So, what is the Mandela Effect? Have you guys, have you guys heard of it? What's the, sort of, what's the sort of core idea around the Mandela Effect? The core idea is that something in the world is collectively remembered to be one thing Mm -hmm. and then is discovered later on in life to be a different thing. For example, there's something to do with Mandela. I can't remember what it is, but (laughs) I think the example you're going to use is with the Berenstain Berenstain bears. I can't remember which way it is around, but they were remembered as the Berenstain bears. They're actually the Berenstain bears, something like that. I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing at the fact that on an episode about memory, you have said the words I can't remember multiple times. I can't times. remember, I can't That's remember much about Nelson Mandela. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so here's the here's the you're right though. Um, a lot of people. <laughs> the idea is that a lot of people in the world misremember a certain fact, and mm. um, and then it turns out later on that it's not true, and it's very difficult for people to come to terms with that. For example, many people believed, um, and I say believed, I don't just mean oh I th- I thought this happened. I mean fully believed convinced yeah convinced that nelson mandela died in prison um and yeah no he he didn't do that in fact he was in prison and then he was released and became um the leader and that's why nelson mandela is yeah. quite famous and yet many people fully believed that he died in prison and it became an issue when they were told hey no he won't, he didn't you know so yeah. they, they wouldn't they couldn't believe it and with the berenstain bears a lot of people um recently over the past couple of years, I found out via Twitter or online that um, the Berenstain Bears are not in fact the Berenstain Bears. So it's the difference between an E and an A. They thought the name was spelt completely differently. And they would go back and look at the old books that they had and look at the, and look at the sort of TV show. And no, they realized it was the, Ber- <laughs> the Berenstain Bears all along. So the idea is effectively that not just one person can misremember something, but mm. a large group of people can misremember something. And I mentioned in the intro, a 90s genie movie. Now, a lot of people think there's a comedian called Sinbad. A lot of people mm. think that he was in a film called Shazam, 
wherein he played a genie. And in fact, mm. uh, you could even find Reddit posts where people were explaining what they thought the plot of this was and saying, oh yeah, I remember this happened and specific plot details. And it's just not true. There was no 90s film with Sinbad called Shazam. There was a 90s film called Kablam with Shaq. Right. Right. So clearly what's going on here is people have misremembered this and changed it, but it's such a common misremembrance that um, a lot of people have it. But that's what we're going to be talking about today. Basically, people misremembering things and how false memories are created. Yeah. Because it's not just forgetting something. That's that's a key point here. It's not just forgetting. It is fully believing that something is not true. No, that something is true when it's not. Yes. Or something is not true when it is true, I suppose. Either way. Yeah. But the point is that it's collectively remembered to be one way by a by a large group of people yes and so it's weird because it turns out to be not the thing that everyone remembers it being yeah exactly yeah yeah quite freaky. well not yeah a large group of people quite not freaky. necessarily everyone but yeah yeah it's, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah it's a freaky thing isn't it so let's get into it before we can actually talk about um the mandela effect uh in more depth and what false memories are we need to understand what memory is in the first place so a lot of people think of memory as sort of a filing cabinet, you know? You know, you remember something, you pop it in your little memory filing cabinet, and mm. when you want to get it later, you just go and get it and you pull it out. But it's not exactly that. A, a memory is kind of a lot of different parts of the brain coming together um, to form basically this concept of what we call a memory. Um, and remembering something is actually pretty similar to sort of just thinking. Thinking and remembering are fairly similar things. So how a memory gets made is basically... You can encode a memory uh, basically by experiencing something. So, you know, anything like I'm experiencing Jamp right now. So I can have a memory of this uh, of this event. Where I you will. I probably won't. No, I know. We'll Too get many into memories of this event. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get into why I won't remember it in a second. But uh, yeah, it, it's not just one thing when you experience something. If you think about it, I'm looking at Jamp right now, but I'm not just looking at Jamp. I'm hearing him. I'm smelling him. Um, oh, yes. I'm I'm touching him. Oh, yeah. A little touch there. You. <laughs> <laughs> Your hands are warm. <laughs> wow, I feel left out. I might remember this. It's the first time we've touched during, a, <laughs> during an episode recording. <laughs> but my point is that there are a lot of different uh, senses or sensory information that goes into experiencing something. And... Um, your brain will basically take all of these individu individual sensory experiences and uh, turn them into one sort of... Um, sort of like a whole entire experience. Mm. And all of those different sensations travel to a part of your brain called the hippocampus. Uh, and then that takes all of those different um, sort of, all of those different uh, perceptions and smooshes them together into a single experience. Um, and scientists think basically that the hippocampus along with uh, the frontal cortex um, is what analyzes all of the sort of sensory information that you get and decides whether it's something you're going to remember or not. Mm. So all of the information goes through the hippocampus and the frontal and the front, uh, the frontal cortex, and they're like, eh, I don't need to remember the smell of jamp right now. I could just toss that one away. <laughs> not that important, is it? It's not that no. important. I don't know why I'm going for because I, I know what you look You're like. Going after my smell. I'm sorry. It's a good smell. It's a it's a perfectly neutral smell. Okay. I'm not smelling you. you at all. Hold on. It's, yeah. You can't smell anything. No, I mean I can I can smell, but nothing. Uh, <laughs> don't you do that. Guys, do you want me to leave <laughs> you guys alone? Oh, I forgot you were here, Luke. Sorry. <laughs> what the fuck are you doing here? Because you can't <laughs> smell me. Your hippocampus is filtering me out. Oh my gosh. Now that I'm hearing senses. you, Luke, I'm remembering your smell and I, I realize uh... that you're... No. So, yeah, your hippocampus basically smushes all of those together into an experience and it decides whether it's going to remember it. Now, it can... Yeah, basically, uh, that is the sort of broad scale of how it works. Mm. Let's go a little more in depth into individual sort of nerves mm. and um, brain cells. So nerve cells connect with other cells at synapses and basically a little et electrical pulses will uh, carry information across those synapses between cells. Um, and each brain cell can have thousands of links mm. to other brain cells like that. And that means that you've got about a hundred trillion synapses. Uh, and the parts of those brain cells that receive the electrical, the electrical impulses are called dendrites, uh, and they've got kind of like feathery tips, and they reach out and they touch all of the sort of brain cells around them with oh. consent. Um, and if you, uh, you, basically, if you've got an electrical pulse across the synapses, it can trigger the release of uh, neurotransmitters, mm -hmm. and neurotransmitters basically uh, 
go across the space between cells and attach to cells nearby. Uh, and they're, the key point about this is that the connections between these cells aren't set in stone. In fact, they change a lot. And that's where we get into sort of neuroplasticity. Mm. So neuroplasticity is this idea that uh, sort of your brain can change in change into a new shape in the same way that plastic can change. Yeah. You know, so the whole point of plastic is that it, you can mold it into a shape and it will stay in that shape. Uh, but with some plastic, you can mold it into a different shape afterwards. That's and that's basically what your brain does. You spend your whole life molding it into a specific shape. Mm. Uh, for example, uh, a pianist, a very good pianist will have a brain that's you know, it's very well set up for being a pianist. It's very good at playing the piano. Those are all the keys are. <laughs> all 88 of them. You do know there's 88 keys. That's very good. 88 keys. <laughs> and I have to reach this far to press this one and this far to press this one. You know, I, re I learned this recently. Um, that there were 88 keys on a, on a piano. Yeah. And do you know how I learned it? How? Because of the confusion between telling if someone is a pianist or a Nazi, because 88 is also a Nazi number. So, oh. So, <laughs> genuinely, so some people were talking about the difficulty of, like, say, someone has 88 in their Twitter name, or if they've got an 88 tattoo, trying to tell whether they're a, night, a white nationalist. Or, they might be super into or piano. Or someone that likes yeah. piano and doesn't really understand. So Imagine oh. going around all your friends and asking what their favorite numbers are, and one of them says 88, and for a brief moment, you're not sure whether they're a Nazi <laughs> or if they play the piano. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Horrific. What if they're both? You know? A Nazi pianist. There will have been some Nazi pianists. They really <laughs> love the number 88. Couple, at least. At least. No. <laughs> It'll be 176 uh, instead. <laughs> uh, that's neuroplasticity, I think. Neuroplasticity, <laughs> again, the idea that uh, your brain can change um, to basically change the connections between uh, different brain cells mm. to form new connections and be better at doing different things, basically. Yeah? Mm. That makes sense? Mm. Yeah. Mm? Mm. Good. Good. Mm. So, <laughs> so in 1949, a neuroscientist called Donald Hebe, Heb, Hebe, let's say Hebe, uh, gave the following hypothesis. When an axon of cell A is near enough to excite cell B and repeatedly or persistently takes part in firing it, some growth process or metabolic change takes place in one or both of the cells such that A's of effic efficiency uh, as one of the cells firing B increases. So basically what that means mm. is that if A makes B fire a lot, then the strength of their connection increases. Um, and then he goes on to say that if A consistently fails to uh, sort of fire B, then the connection between them is weakened. In much the same way that if right. I hang out with Luke every day, my connection with Luke is going to be strengthened, can be very, mm. very good friends. But if I just stop hanging out with Luke altogether, then our connection is going to weaken over time to the point where we're not really friends. Yeah, you forget about each other. Yeah, we free forever. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. That's and how that's, memory works. That's, well, no, that's, <laughs> My that's hippocampus just filters out all memories of Cory. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> I'm the silence. Well, that's if right. you filter out Luke, then time ceases to exist. So <laughs> <not>. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> but we need time. Oh, better I, keep Luke then. <laughs> this podcast is really not accessible for new viewers at all. <laughs> no, it's really not. <laughs> Go back about for every episode we've ever made. Oh, You'll get the joke of it. Back about 90 episodes, you should get there. So again, this is neuro. This is kind of the idea of neuroplasticity and um, the idea that if you um, sort of long-term potentiation is what it's called. Mm. Basically, if you continue to use a connection, uh, you strengthen it in the same way that if you continue to use your muscles, you strengthen them. Mm. But if you stop using them, they weaken. That's why people say the brain is a muscle. You use it or you lose it because mm. it's pretty much true. You got to use it yeah. to strengthen those connections. And that's why studying helps as well, because yeah. studying is going over information again and again, strengthening those connections. And you know, if they're stronger, then they can last longer, basically. Yeah. I it's believe, not... yes. I believe Heb is, is the man who came up with the famous phrase, cells that wire together, sorry, fire together, wire together. You're right. Yeah. 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 He did. Did he come up? Did he come up with that off the top of your head? Oh, wow. Well, I didn't. Heb did. No, I know he did, but I just didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll take credit if you want me to, Cory. No. <laughs> cells. Ce One second, I have an insight. Cells that fire together, wire together. 
You're and here welcome. we have the creation of a false memory for Luke. Wow, Mandela <laughs> effect. When someone else says that Never Heb said, said that, that, half of no. the population of Psy Guys listeners will go, but I remember Luke saying it. <laughs> <laughs> that is the Mandela effect in a nutshell. I mean, that's just misinformation, isn't it? But again, <laughs> that's not the whole picture. The sort of A uh, firing B more and strengthen, strengthening their connection. Um, there is also um, another sort of rule that goes along with this. Uh, that's sort of about predictability. So if A consistently fires just before B, yeah. then their connection can be strengthened as well. Basically what I'm saying is that the, the sort of idea of um, A uh, sort of exciting B making it fire um, and that sort of consistent thing mm -hmm. happening again to strengthen the connection, that is not the only way that this works. That's just a very, very simplified sort of look at it. Is this what we roughly touched on in our Little Albert episode? <clears throat> Like the association kind of yeah yeah that's yeah. so that's that's similar as well so association um, forming memories can memories can form by association as well so um, and and yeah actually you're you're right so this kind of comes into the sort of Pavlovian thing with mm -hmm. sort of um, it, basically the idea of this is that time is important as well so sort of not so much time but the order that things happen is important as well so um, if you were to say for a Pavlovian response if you were to sort of the idea of the Pavlov's dogs. Do you guys know what that is? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we talked about it. Yeah, yeah we did. Okay, good. I'll just, <laughs> just, let's just explain for some of the listeners in case they don't know. Episode 25, if you want it in depth. Yeah. This is listen to that. Experiment. What do you want me to explain it? Go for it. Yeah. This is an experiment where, um, Pavlov, uh, did you ring a bell? He rang, does a, ring a bell. Yeah. Thanks, for, a, thanks for bringing it up. Mm -hmm. He rang a bell <laughs> and then he gave some food to some dogs and, uh, he managed to train them to the point where just ringing the bell caused them to salivate because of the anticipation of food. Exactly. Yeah. But if you were to, um, if you were to ring the bell, um, sorry, if you were to give them the food and then, then ring the bell, then it wouldn't, um, it, you wouldn't have that sort of connection. So, so they're out of order. Yeah, and if order. you yeah. gave them food and didn't ring the bell, then the dogs would ring the bell. No. <laughs> the dogs would just say, it. Ding. ring it with their opposable thumbs. <laughs> yeah. ding, ding, you ding, ding, oh, ding. Mate, you forgot to ring the bell. Ding, ding, ding. There you go. <laughs> Sir, forgot to do the homework. <laughs> Goodness me. So uh, what I'm saying here is that the order matters as well. And if you want to look more in depth with this, I've got some, there's some good sort of descriptions of this theory, this theory, this idea more in depth in the description. Uh, but moving on, the idea to take away from this is, as Luke said, cells that fire together, wire together. I did, I did say that. That's true. Oh. Oh, cells sure. that play together, stay together. Oh, <laughs> wow. Go. Good one. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, that, that's kind of the idea of long-term potentiation that, uh, sort of using, using a connection more and more strengthens it. Um, so that's the basis of memory, kind of. That's the sort of basis for how memory forms. Yeah. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Basically, you, your, your experiences go through your brain. Your brain says, I'm going to remember this or I'm not. And then sort of going over those experiences again, running over mm. those thoughts in your head again, can strengthen those memories. But not sort of doing that can weaken it. And, it, sorry, go on. I was just going to ask, is, is not only time and repetition, is the intensity of the experience also related to how it wires? We'll, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that in, okay. a, bit, cool. in a sec, yeah. Uh, so a, another key point is attention. So you need to be paying attention to commit something to memory. So you experience lots of things at once, but your brain will filter them out. Uh, for example, here's uh, here's a little question for you. Um, what color are my glasses? Ready uh, brown. Gotti. Gotti. Black. <laughs> Ready brown. <laughs> Some tint of gold. What? Well, okay. Are they black? What's interesting <gasps> oh, here no, I was... is that I have two pairs of glasses. I've been uh... wearing a black pair this entire time up until I asked you the question. <laughs> and you both... You both, oh. what you both did, what you both did is great because it's, it's almost, it's showing almost an example of false memory here. You I guys myself. knew uh, from some other point that I, I do have a pair of sort of goldish glasses, Yeah. but I don't wear those. I don't wear those for side guys. I haven't done for, for months. And I just saw you take them off. You just saw me take off my black glasses. Did? Oh, well, I'm, I'm seeing through a webcam. They look kind of red on this webcam for some reason. I'm, mate, I'm looking at the... It's because of, no, the... of the purple in the room. They look kind of like ready tinted. I'm pretty sure they were... I'm pretty sure they did take off the black ones because uh, I, 
I actually did initially say black, but then I doubt myself. I like, All I'm saying, no. Corey, is I do not know that you have, I've not paid any attention to what glasses <laughs> color you wear. So That's fine. it's only come from this now you image. Will. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally fine. My point As you here should. Is, my point here is that you have been like, you, Jap, you've been looking at me this entire time, right? No. And you said, <laughs> almost this entire time. And you said, you said black initially, but then you changed it to a sort of ready brown because Luke almost ah, I influenced you, you with that. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. And so it's very easy to sort of I doubted myself and then rushed into my head and I was like, what color are Corey's glasses? Right. And so they're usually gold. Yes, this is the idea right. that um memories can sort of be influenced not only by someone saying something to you, but consciously if your brain is like so your sort of percep perception of things, right? Mm. It, that's influenced by what your brain thinks you should be perceiving. Mm. So if you see my glasses and you're like and your brain's like, well, I know that Corey's glasses are usually like sort of ready gold. So I probably did see ready gold glasses. Yeah. That, like your brain sort of tricks itself into thinking things that it, it thinks should be true. Yeah. And here's another one for you. Um, which direction does the fe the queen face on a coin? Oh, no. Left. 50 50 chance. It's left, isn't it? You both said left. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if you can see this. You could maybe put it on. Stop screen. it. Is right. she getting right? No. She faces oh. right. She's facing Wait. right. Yeah. On every coin. Maybe. I don't know. On a two pence coin, she faces right. But my point here is that how often have you guys looked at coins? Well, quite frequently. Right? Yeah. And still, you don't know what direction the queen faces. She is facing right on every coin. Every single coin. What the flip? Mad, right? Turn round. <laughs> Turn round. <laughs> Absolutely mental. Absolutely mental. And that's the thing. It's, it's, it's unbelievable how easy it is for us to not remember things we think we should remember. For example, if you ask someone to say, uh, describe something that they should know the look of fairly well, they mm. may be, they might find it difficult. You might not know the eye color of plenty of your friends, mm. despite the fact that you look at directly at their eyes very often. No. Yeah. Um, the, the idea is that you need to be paying attention to something to remember it because your brain will just filter things out if you're not paying very much attention. Um, although scientists don't know necessarily yet uh, whether stimuli are screened out during the sort of sensory input stage or after brain processes uh, what is and isn't significant. Um, but if it's filtered out, then it won't be committed to memory. And there are also different kinds of memory. You guys have probably heard of short-term memory and long-term memory, right? Mm. Yeah. So once a memory is made, um, it's got to be stored. It doesn't matter how briefly it's got to be stored. It's got to be stored um, at some point. If it's not running around in your synapses, mm -hmm. then it, it doesn't exist in your head, basically. So um, there are three ways that we store memories. So first, in the sensory stage, uh, we sort of store those very quickly as they're happening, basically. Yeah. Um, and then they can move to short-term memory. Um, and then for some memories, they can then be stored into long-term memory. And at each stage, your brain kind of filters out. Is like, is this important? Eh, it's yeah. not. Eh, color of Corey's glasses? Yeah, it's, mm. it's not going to matter. But now it is. Now you've got to oh. be paying attention. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pay attention. you got to pay attention to these. <laughs> so, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> There's not going to be a quiz. Uh, we don't store everything in long-term memory, though, because we've got too much stuff going on. I mean, think about all of the sensory inputs that are happening right now to your body. There, are, if I okay, how about this? If you're sitting down right now, think about the feeling of whatever you're sitting down on touching you. Think about how the clothes are touching your skin. Ugh. Think about the air temperature in the room. Think about your breathing. Think about the size of your tongue in your mouth. No. Think about the feeling of maybe you've got an itchy nose or something. Think about literally everything that's going on right now. The little sounds oh. that you can potentially hear in the background, the taste of your own mouth, how much saliva is in there. All of those the things you're experiencing. Your this is yeah, the worst meditation video I've ever heard. <laughs> it is a <isn't> hyper aware. <laughs> <laughs> think about this, now think about this, now think about this, now think about this. Now think about this. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> reverse Third meditation. Activate. As you started listing things off, I took a sip of my tea and then I just felt all of the liquid slide down my throat. Yeah. I was like, oh, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the thing. Um, look, I've just taken a drink of water. Yeah. As you said that, I can literally feel the cold traveling down. Traveling my lips downwards. are just a little bit wet. It's, um, it's my, my fingers are slightly more moist now. <laughs> all of these things you are literally experiencing all the time. You, you're not, it's not like you sort of um, just stop like, uh, put it this way, when you close your eyes, your eyes don't just suddenly stop seeing. No. They're continuing to see, you just kind of start to filter it. And you're like, oh, it doesn't matter, I don't need this. Um, and there's actually a fantastic book which you'll find in the description called Incognito, which talks more about this um, and sort of perception and, and how that works. It's fantastic, would definitely recommend it. But my point here is that there was a lot of input happening 
a lot of the time and you've got to filter that out. If you were to remember every single thing, mm -hmm. you would fill up the memory pretty quick. You know? Yeah. Put it this way. Okay. You don't need to film everything in 4K, the highest resolution possible. No. No. I mean, you could get away with shooting some things in lower resolution because yeah. it just it just doesn't really matter. Yeah. Exactly. And that's what your brain's doing. It's just lowering the resolution because it's like, mm -hmm. eh, it's whatever. No. That's the idea of sort of why you need to have limited, um, limited things going through into your long-term memory. So as I said, the creation of a memory starts when you perceive something. Um, and usually like, you know, that's just a very, very brief thing. And then after that sort of first sort of instant, it can be stored in short-term memory, whatever sensation it is. Um, and short-term memory has got unlimited capacity. Um, apparently you can only hold about seven things for about 20 to 30 seconds at a time. Um, and you can increase that, you know, a bit. So for example, a phone number is too much just to remember all as one thing, mm. which is why you'll probably find people splitting their phone numbers into chunks. 07, number, 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 you know. That is the correct way of remembering it. Any other way is incorrect. <laughs> I find it so stressful when someone's like, 074591. I'm like, what? No, oh, wait, too many the, in a row. the one is in a mi one, wait, hang on. <laughs> Those are the first numbers of Luke's actual phone number, by the way. Mm. Are they? I, I the last don't. numbers. I don't, I don't know your phone number. <laughs> I don't know, know your phone fo number off by heart, Corey. I don't because I don't need to because I have a magic device capable of doing it for me. What um, if you're in a crisis and you need me quite in, easy, aren't they? on a desert island? <laughs> and, and the only phone is someone else's phone. I'd call my mum. Your mum doesn't have my number. <laughs> so moving on, you can remember phone numbers you know, by splitting them up into different things. Um, and also if you repeat things, you can keep it running around um, sort of in your head. That's why, you know, if you don't want to forget something, you can just say it over and over and over and over and over until you need to say, write it down or, or, or do whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's still keeping it in the short-term memory. Um, and that sort of gradually transfers from the short-term memory into the long-term memory. Um, and the more you sort of repeat information or use it, um, the, the sort of more... Uh, the, the more likely it is to be moved into the long-term memory and the stronger that memory will be. For example, um, the intro to this show, uh, hello and welcome to the Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Jamp and Luke Cutforth. I don't need to read that from the screen. In fact, I can't read it from the screen because it tricks me up. It trips me up if I try and do that because it's just yeah. stored in my memory. It's just stored in there because I need to say it every week and I have done for almost 100 weeks in a row. 100, yeah. <laughs> so... Wow, look at us, champ, living rent-free in Corey's head. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that. that you know, the, and you, you're aware of this. The more you need to sort of use information or perform a task, the more you're sort of, the easier it will be to do that, the easier it will be to remember how to do that. Uh, but that's, that's sort of um, long-term memory. But also a key thing to remember here is that, um, this is something that I find really interesting, is that it's much easier to learn and remember things when you already have a basis um, sort of base knowledge in that area. So mm -hmm. for example, it's much easier for me to sort of learn about um, specific areas of science because I've already gotten a basis in that area from my degree. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, for example, learning about, say, things with film, Luke, um, or with, say, editing, Jap, learning things about those will be easier for you because you already have a base knowledge in them. Whereas yeah. if you were to start trying to learn about something that you don't necessarily know about, it can be harder. And the reason for that is that there's already more connections in your brain if you have a base knowledge. So there's more things for that sort of memory to connect to. Mm -hmm. And as you can, as, as you've probably picked up <laughs> by now, connections are key. The more connections you've got, the more likely something is to be remembered. And that's sort of one of the reasons that memory sort of uh, tricks really work. You know how people tell themselves stories to remember all the numbers in pi? Um, the, oh, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. reason that works is because just random digits of pi have no meaning whatsoever. But if you say a story, it's quite it's easier to remember a story, and so it's easier to remember those things. Basically, making connections can make it easier to remember things. Mm -hmm. Yes, Luke? I have a very vague memory um, of reading something fairly recently about um, the, there, are, there are two different things in memory where you have conscious access to memories, and then there are also unconscious access unaccessible memories and the suggestion was that actually you probably remember an awful lot of what happens to you but you don't have it's almost like cordoned off it has it's unconnected um, and you're talking about connections and i wonder because like people have experiences where they go back to their childhood and they remember every single piece of information about things they thought they'd long forgotten 
it. You've just a little bit spoiled what's coming up. Uh, but no, oh, sorry. Uh, well done. Good job. No, um, there are so there are things. There are different kinds of memory. Um, so I'm going to talk about working versus procedural memory in just a sec, and um, that that does touch on a little bit of what you were talking about there. Uh, mm. But in terms of sort of not remembering something and then going back to your childhood and actually remembering a lot of it, mm. um, see if you think about it if it's going back to a certain place and that triggers one thing that can trigger a lot of other memories because they're all connected. Yeah. So they so do remain example, there. They're just, you just haven't triggered that specific pathway. Yeah. But and it's, it can be harder to get into that pathway because mm. there's, mm. You're, you're lacking that connection, but the sort of visual information of say, going back to a childhood home can trigger, can sort of trigger that initial pathway mm. by that initial connection. So I think that's probably what's going on there. And from there, it can almost be like a domino effect. Yeah. Where one activates the next, activates the next. And so there's some so things on. that, yeah, exactly. There's some things that are really good for triggering memory, like smells or um, tastes. So that's why people say if you chew gum while you're revising, it can potentially improve your memory if you chew, if you chew the same flavor of gum whilst in the exam. Obviously, that's ridiculous. No one's going to let you chew gum in an exam. And it's probably yeah. easier just to learn it anyway. But you know, that, that's probably where that's coming from. But what I'm going to talk about now is um, working versus procedural uh, memory. So just because you need to be paying attention um, to sort of remember something, that doesn't need, I mean that you need to be consciously aware of learning something to learn it, or even that you're consciously, consciously aware of what you've learned. Uh, you guys have both driven before, right? Yes. Mm. Yep. Okay. So I want you to do something for me. Um, just hold your hands up as though you're, um, as though you're, you've got a steering wheel in front of you, right? Make sure the cameras can see it. Make sure everyone at home can see what we're doing. Now, um, you can close your eyes if you want. Just imagine that you're driving a car. Now, I want you to, you're in one lane. You need to switch lanes. Now, just show me what you do and explain what you're doing whilst you're, whilst you're doing it. I'm using my blinker. Yeah, I'm putting down my Flick. indicator. Looking over my shoulder. Ooh, yeah. Blind spot. Oh, yeah. yeah, there's no one there. Uh, and then, and then like, well, feed the wheel yeah. through my hands. <laughs> so it's a bit like that. Yeah. 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 So the steering wheel, where does it, if this is the steering wheel, yes. where does it go? Like the sort of the front of the steer, the top of the steering wheel, how do you need to turn it to switch lanes? Luke? Yeah. I think you've got, I think you've got it. Like but each hand goes in opposite directions. One goes yeah. up, one goes down, for example. And then where does it, where does the steering wheel go after that? So you've turned, so you've turned the steering wheel to say the right. Yeah. And then what do you do after that? Goes back to uh, center. Goes back to center. You kind of like you overcorrect a little bit. Look, so the idea here is that it doesn't go back to center. You were right there when you said you've got to overcorrect a yeah, little bit. Oh, tiny bit. yeah. Tiny bit. Well, that's not actually correct. Um, so, oh, really? No, so, well, okay, so if you were doing that when you're on the road, you would 100% crash. And what's interesting here is that you guys are finding it difficult to remember how you switch lanes. But actually, to switch lanes, what you need to do is turn your steering wheel to the right. Yeah. And then turn it equal an equal uh, distance back equal yeah, distance equal distance back oh i guess because if you think about yeah, it the wheels need sense. to turn yeah and then to get yourself straight you need to turn back yeah and then you're going straight so you turn your you turn the steering, steering wheel back to center out, yeah. and this is the thing most people when asked this question um will find it difficult to sort of say okay this is exactly how you need to turn the steering wheel in order to drive it but if you're driving a car i'm not in a car that's the thing i was like Ooh, yeah but yeah that's the thing picture exactly so and even if you were in a car having to explain what you were doing yeah. you'd probably find it difficult. You'd only really be able to explain it because you were watching yourself do it. Yeah. And even then, we know that trying to explain what you're doing or think about what you're doing while doing it can make doing that thing harder. And the reason for that is that um, you're not necessarily consciously aware of a lot of, a lot of actions. And mm. so driving a car would kind of sit in your procedural memory, the memory that you've got for the sort of muscle movements that you need to do for certain things. So that's right. like walking, running, um, all of these different things you could do. Like, uh, kicking a ball even you know mm. you don't need to think okay i need to angle it exactly no you just kick the ball yeah your brain says kick ball and your body's like i remember how to do that cool so there's different kinds of memory is what i'm getting at here yeah. um and working memory is the sort, sort of more conscious memory um that's the sort of thing that we usually talk about when we're talking about memory mm. um and so what, what's really interesting here is if you've got people that have got anterograde amnesia who can't form new sort of memories in the traditional sense, you know, they can't remember things that they've done yesterday, for example, mm -hmm. um, you can give them a game of Tetris. You can make them play Tetris for a bit, get, get good at Tetris, and then go to them the next day and show them the game of Tetris. And they'll be like, I have never seen this game before in my life because they've forgotten playing it the, the day before. Yeah. But if you actually look at how they're playing, they will have increased in skill by the same by the same level as people who don't have amnesia, so they're still ah. like they, while they can't remember having played it, they still have that procedural memory. 
because different parts of the brain are involved in a different part, different kinds of memory. So procedural memory is handled by a different part of the brain yeah. than your sort of working memory. That's so cool. It's really cool, isn't it? Yeah. So the the idea of memory being one sort of solid thing is not necessarily the case. And you're not nece- necessarily conscious of all of your memories, uh, which kind of ties into what you were saying earlier, Luke, about people, uh, about memories kind of almost being hidden from you in a sense, mm. because memories can absolutely be hidden from you and could be triggered by something else. That reminds me of uh, the Split Brains episode where you ask someone why they laughed and they are like, they make up a completely stupid reason because the part of their brain that laughed is now severed from the part of the brain that talks. Yeah. Um, that is just so fascinating. Yeah. So a lot of this, um, a lot of what I'm talking about right now is also in that book that I mentioned, Incognito. And I, I revisited the split brain thing because of that. Mm. And it is it is super interesting. So definitely go back and listen to Luke's episode on that if you want to hear more. Um, episode 40. So um, Luke, you were saying earlier about different sort of um, different kinds of memory uh, based on how sort of um, intense um, an experience is, weren't you? Yeah, like a like a traumatic memory or an extremely happy memory. Yeah. So, so essentially, what's going on here is I said beforehand that the hippocampus uh, is the bit that sol- consolidates memories. Now that is true, but if something frightening, traumatic, or otherwise very stressful happens, then the amygdala also um, lays out a memory for the event too. So ah. your brain has basically developed uh, more than one way of creating yeah. memories, and those memories can be harder to forget, and they can come back very suddenly as flashbacks basically that's what you see in people with ptsd the amygdala is just like hey you're this thing is happening again here are all these experiences because i know you want to i know you want them um and that's basically what a flashback is a very intense memory that can just be triggered um seemingly out of nowhere and it's very difficult to forget and it, it, it it's experiencing a memory um a sort of memory like that is very different than experiencing normal memory it can be much more vivid and also it, it could be much more based on experience and emotion rather than uh, absolute sort of objective fact. Mm. Although, as you will see, most mem- like not all memories are necessarily factual, uh, yeah. but these particular sort of traumatic memories are more based on feeling than, say, more other memories. Mm. Um, and so that's that kind of area of memory. And then we can also talk about uh, forgetting and failing in memories. So memories can fail. You can forget something uh, when either your perception is inaccurate um, or you didn't register something properly to begin with. So, you know, if you didn't, you weren't paying attention to where you put something and you lost it. Mm-hmm. Um, or you're not paying enough attention when encoding. So you're not paying enough inten- attention when you're actually remembering the thing. So you don't store the memory properly, um, even though you think you did. So for example, you're reading a book and then you realize, uh, you know, three pages later, I've not been reading this book. I've been reading <laughs> yeah, it properly. Yeah. You've just, you weren't paying enough attention. You thought Zoned you were. Out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly, researching that happens so because I'm thinking about something else, Honestly. and then I realize that that thought has taken over the, the sort of main the main thing I'm supposed the to be task. doing. And then the last one is when you can't retrieve the memory accurately uh, due to a mismatch in um, sort of the, the cues that you're using to retrieve something and the actual the where the thing is stored in your memory itself. Mm. So effectively, if you think about this, like if you're searching on your computer, right, you can't quite remember the file name that you that you named something. Mm you're going to have trouble finding it. And that's what sort of like having trouble remembering something could be like basically um, the cues that you've got to try and retrieve that memory mismatch with how it's encoded. Yeah. Um, and that's forgetting things. Now forgetting things are really, is really different from false memories. So why don't we talk about what false memories actually are? So forgetting something is quite literally that information just isn't there or it's incomplete, but false memories are different in that sort of the blanks can be filled um, with something that, isn't true mm-hmm. or An even com- yeah or even completely fabricated yeah um which is it, it incredibly interesting that that is something we are completely capable of just fabricating um fabricating a reality and believing it to be true yeah 100 percent. and this isn't sort of mental illness bear in mind this is um this is something that every single person on this planet does uh, fairly regularly mm-hmm. it's it's not uncommon well, it just seems like a <laughs> dreadfully unhelpful feature of our brains. What? You say that, right? You say it might. You say it seems like an unhelpful feature, but actually, I, so I was reading that apparently, um, this this is like this may be slightly better um, than having one hundred percent perfect recall. So the example that I was reading, um, it was basically uh, based on sort of probability. So you had basically two options. 
uh, you had a hundred percent chance of getting a million a million pounds, or an, uh, in the second option you had an eighty nine percent chance of getting a million pounds, a ten percent chance of getting yeah a ten percent chance of getting um, five million pounds, or a one percent chance of getting nothing. Mm -hmm. Now most people, when presented with those options, will be like, "I'll just go with a million because mm. like I'm a hundred percent chance of getting a million. Those are better odds. That feels better." Whereas um, the second option is actually statistically the That's better it. option. Yeah, but you know, people just kind of gesture, sort of gesture broadly an idea um, mm. rather than specifically, um, specifically sort of think it through. And so with memory, it's a similar sort of thing. Remembering everything specifically and exactly may not be as good for survival as having a general idea um, when it comes to taking risks. So if something seems like a kind of bad idea, it's probably better to avoid that rather than, you know, having a specific ex exact idea of mm. all of your past experiences. We'll, we'll get <laughs> on to we'll get on to why it might be um, why it might be slightly more beneficial or why it's something that um, like you know, sort of why of it in a bit. Uh, but here's here's the thing: false memories. Um, false memory can describe um, a sort of range of different errors in your memory, from just misremembering um, sort of words that are in lists mm. to sort of in like incorrect details when telling a story to a completely sort of fabricated um completely fabricated like memory um and elizabeth f loftus is someone that will come up a lot if you're looking into this uh, she's done a lot of uh, studies on this and um yeah she's her, her research she found that memories can be distorted um and she's done a few a few different studies on this, particularly in sort of in the areas of um, how this affects witnesses and sort of um, mm -hmm. witness testimony. Um, uh, and in one study, subjects were shown a video of um, crimes or accidents, not actual crimes or accidents, just ones that were sort of simulated, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and then you could make the subjects believe details that weren't true. Just small details, like changing a stop sign to a yield sign, yeah. or um, the, the sort of the, the facial features or the look of the uh, the criminal, you know, just little things like that. But when it comes to witness testimony, that's those little things can be very big. For example, okay, someone has uh, that person had sort of um, short hair, and they actually had long hair. Well, that changes who your suspect is. Mm. Oh, did they? Uh, did they like? Did they sort of run through a stop sign or a yield sign? Those are sort of different things. Was there even a stop sign there? All of these different um, sort of tiny little alterations that can be made to memory that can just kind of be influenced can have big sort of consequences. Yes, Luke. Can I ask a very specific and pr question that you might not have an answer to? You can, but I might not have an answer to it. That's true. You might not. Um, do you? Is there any idea or any indication as to whether? This kind of false memory thing is happening, um, i.e., the the either that the brain is actually writing false memories, or if um, upon trying to recall something, um, there is an imperfect information, and so whatever function is happening that pre presents us with the memory is filling in the gaps. Like, is the false <clears throat> memory present in the brain, or are the gaps filled in upon um, recognition? From what I've gathered, right. It seems that, and there are lots of different cases for false memories happening. It can happen in Alzheimer's. It can happen in, um, there's even, I think, false memory syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of different ways of it happening. Uh, sometimes it can happen through suggestions. So uh, you can ask someone to recall something, but um, sort of influence what they're recalling by giving a sort of biased question, sort of leading leading the witness, essentially. Yeah. Um, so in that case, uh, the brain can... It's sort of almost in the same way that um, the brain can sort of say, "Oh, I'm I should be perceiving this, so that's what I'm perceiving." You know, that's that's how that false memory could be written. Yeah, by the brain being like, "Oh, well, hold on. If it was, if say the glasses were supposed to be brown, then they must have been brown." Like, "Oh, I must mm -hmm. be misremembering." So th that's yeah. one way they can be written. Um, other ways they can be written is just um, through. Yeah, sort of incomplete details. And when you think about those details and try to recall them, yeah, the brain will fill in the blanks. If you think about it, your brain fills in the blanks an awful lot and yeah. you don't even notice it. I was, I was going to bring this up uh, quite a bit later, but um, you've got a blind spot in your vision, right? Oh, I hate it. Yeah, it, it's, an, it's incredibly infuriating. <laughs> and I don't, want to, I don't want to go into how to find your blind spot or whatever. We'll just power through this. You have a blind spot in your vision. Um, you've got two. 
actually, because um, on each eye. Yeah, because the back of your um, the back of your eye, you've got basically where your optical nerve connects to your the back of your eye, and that can't see anything. So throughout your entire life, there are two points in your vision that are completely empty, but you are not aware of those because your brain just fills in with what it thinks should be yeah. there. Uh, and so all throughout your life, your brain is sort of editing your perception. And so it doesn't, it does make sense that it will do that with memory as well, because as we've said, memory and sort of thoughts are not too dissimilar. And if you think about it, your perception, your experience of the world is not exact. It is being, it's being filtered through your brain. It's in it. And <laughs> this is the, this is the thing they've done studies as well, wherein um, just thinking about seeing something mm. can have very similar patterns to seeing the thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a sort of <laughs> to sort of get back to your question, Luke. There are different ways for it to happen, but um, in in some cases it can be yeah, trying to recall something with um, incomplete detail, and the brain sort of filling things in either through um, sort of suggestion or what it thinks should be there, and then that again that can get compounded to the point where it is just sort of fully believed. Mm. So if you think about it, with the more you think about something, the sort of um, the stronger those connections get. So mm. if you think that Nelson Mandela, say, died in prison, mm. um, and every single time you think about Nelson Mandela, you're like, oh yeah, he died in prison. Yeah. Just strengthens that sort of idea that, yeah, Nelson Mandela died in prison, despite the fact that he didn't. He, he, he dem demonstrably did not. So yeah, um, false memories, back to those. Um, Elizabeth Loftus studied them and looked into sort of, uh, sort of looked into how that worked with witness testimony and whatnot. Um, and she says it's pretty easy to distort memories uh, for the details of what they actually saw by supplying them with suggestive information. Um, yes. But then later we began to ask just how far you could go with people. Could you implant an entire false memory into the mind of, uh, into the minds of people for things that never happened? And you absolutely can. Uh, so they, they did this study wherein basically 70% of the subjects were made to believe that they had committed a crime like theft, assault, or um, assault with a weapon just by um, using memory retrieval techniques in interviews. Um, and it's not just in a research setting that this was done. So in 19, uh, 1986, uh, someone called Nadine Kuhl, um, who was a nurse's aide in Wisconsin, she was looking for therapy uh, from a psychiatrist um, because uh, her daughter had experienced a traumatic event. And she wanted to help. She wanted help coping with it. Um, and then during therapy, her psychiatrist used hypnosis and other suggestive techniques to dig out buried memories of abuse that um, Nadine had gone through herself. Oh my goodness! Um, uh, she she was convinced that she had repressed memories of being in a satanic cult, of eating babies, of horrible, horrible things uh, that I will not say on this podcast. Um, and she like she had all she had all of these beliefs that all of all of these things that happened to her um and then you know she she later found out that actually all of those all of those memories that this sort of psychiatrist had brought out of her had been false but she had been completely believing them um and then she ended up uh, suing the uh suing the psychiatrist um and got a settlement of 2.4 million outside of- Whoa. Court. Oh my God. Whoa. She's not the only one to have done something like this, by the way, as well. Like the people have sued psychiatrists for this, but if you think about it, if you're, if you're a psychiatrist and yeah. your job is to kind of, and you, you know that lots of these things happen to lots of people, it can, it can be easy enough to unintentionally do that. Yeah. It should also be easy enough to intentionally do that. I don't know whether they did it, whether they did it intentionally or not, but the fact <laughs> is that um, it is possible to implant entirely fabricated in memories into people just by sort of suggesting them to them. Mm. And there is one theory for why our brains come up with false memories. Um, uh, it's, you could call it the fuzzy trace theory. Um, and essentially it's the idea that you sort of, you got a, you got a gist, you got a gist of what happened. Yeah. And a lot of the time, all you need is a gist. You know, I, I know a Corey wears glasses. What color are they? Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah he uh, wears them. He wears them. Mm. Got a gist of that. And that's generally fine. If you've got a gist of what your childhood was like, it was, it was pretty good. Yeah. That's fine. You don't need to remember every individual instance. Um, you know, like for, you know, the, for example, you don't need to remember that um, you were lost in a shopping mall as a child because it's not really important. You know, you've got a general gist of your, of your childhood and it's, it's all pretty good. Um, and this, this sort of theory um, was offered to explain the, uh, the Dees Rodiger McDermott paradigm. And that is based on an experiment. Uh, so we'll call that the DRM paradigm, by the way. That's based on an experiment where basically they had a list of words and they got people to recall words that weren't in that list. And the way mm. they did that was basically these words were all related. So 
thimble, um, so it's thimble, sewing, um, thread, all of those words, and the sort of word that connected them was needle. Uh, the word needle wasn't in the uh. list, but you could you could kind of by um, by giving people this list of words, they would read the list of words. Um, when you later ask them to recall that list of words, they could add needle to the list. Yeah, thinking that it was in there because they're trying to think. It's like oh, they've got the gist of what yeah. the category is, right? Like a and, semantic field. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's it's just really interesting that that that's kind of the that's kind of one thing you can that's kind of one sort of simple thing that you can do. Um, and there are other sort of there are other sort of explanations for different um, ways of misremembering things. Mm. Um, so, for example, um, in autobi in autobiographical false memories, there are things called sort of you've got known errors, biased guesses, um, false beliefs, and false memories. Mm -hmm. So, if someone if someone says something to you that isn't true about their life, they could just be lying to you. That is one hundred percent something they could be doing. But when they actually believe it, so what could be happening is they're not entirely sure. But because they were there, they kind of make a guess without really realizing it and then kind of start to believe that guess. Um, and then there's false beliefs, something that they believe to be true, but just isn't. Mm -hmm. And if you continue, if you believe something to be true, you can, again, try to start coming up with actual memories that support that belief. Yeah. Um, and that can then sort of turn into a full, a full false memory. So, for example, I have been told the story of when I was a child. Uh, I was walking along the street with my grandparents and I lost a shoe. It was in the snow and I didn't say anything for ages. Uh, and they couldn't find the shoe because I was just walking along happily, not mentioning that my shoe had gone. <laughs> um, I have a memory of that happening. Kind of. It's oh, fuzzy. Really? I, but I don't. I, I, was, I don't remember that happening. I've just been told that story so many times oh, that I'm like... Like secondhand. Yeah, I've got a memory of it. Yeah, a second, it's a secondhand memory of... Wow. I've been told this has happened so many times that now I, I remember it. Yeah. But I don't remember it at all. You yeah. know, and it, it feels it feels very similar to a memory, but it just, I mean, it happened, but I don't remember it happening. So yeah. you could you could see how you could do the same thing by telling a kid, oh, that time that you did this, that time you did this, that time you did this, until they're like, yeah, that time I did mm. this, I remember that happening. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they actually they actually can do that. They've they've done that with people. So there's this sort of uh, the loss in the mall technique, mm. uh, where basically um, you could. Uh, almost trick uh, a sort of child, someone that's younger, uh, say like between the ages of like eight to 14 into believing that, that they were lost in the mall. Um, mm. Or you can trick someone into believing they were lost in the mall when they were younger, um, just by sort of telling them that they, that they were and telling them the details of the story uh, from sort of trusted family members and things like that. Mm. Um, and they will believe that they were lost in a shopping center when yeah. they were a kid. And because it's a kind of a traumatic memory, a traumatic memory, um, it can, almost be strengthened in that sense to become a full false memory. And that's the thing with, with kids, it can be, it can almost be, it can sometimes be easier to um, implant these memories. So mm. I've got a few different, um, I've got a couple different studies here. So they did a, uh, they did um, a study on false memories in kids asking um, basically how the plausibility of a lie affects the creation of false memories. And it was a small sample size, but it's a pretty interesting result. So it's called planting false ideas in children, the role of plausibility. How did you get that past an ethics council? Oh, it, this wasn't, this was just, um, okay, so, look, the experiment- Planting false memories in children. They were Nothing not, wrong they weren't this. bad memories. <laughs> so one of them, <laughs> so um, they had, they had two true events and then they had two false events. One of the false events was um, the kid being lost in a mall when they were four years old. Uh, they did this to five to seven year old kids and nine to 12 year old kids, by the way. So um, the first false event was, the kid being lost in a shopping mall when they were younger. And the second false event was the implausible false event, which was the child receiving a rectal enema. Um, so, <laughs> so, what? Uh, so 50%, 54%, actually over 50% of the kids um, didn't remember either false memory, the plausible or the implausible. Um, but around about 40 ish, uh, just under that, maybe um, remembered the plausible, but not the implausible event. And then only one, uh, only one kid ended up um, remembering um, the implausible event, but not the plausible one. Mm. So basically, um, <laughs> basically, a lot of a lot of people um, will remember false events when they're younger. Like if you tell a kid this happened, you've got a you've got a yeah. almost fifty percent chance of the kid potentially remembering yeah. that as an actual memory. I wonder it if there's any. This may just be um, 
a thing that happened in my head when you were listening. Well, I was listening to you talk about this, but I wonder if this could be like, for example, if the kid has a vague memory of like something bad happening as a kid, um, and that kind of slots into that gap that they have where they go, well, that kind of makes sense for this. Or well, this is what the brain might do is like s- slot that in as like, well, that kind of makes sense of this vague thing I feel in in like this thing I feel. Um, would, would like for example, would it be more likely that somebody with a with a an like a, a, a repressed negative memory would be likely to uptake a another potential false negative memory well, to make sense of that feeling? Well, I don't know. I think I think okay. So that's kind of ex- I think that's kind of an explanation. Um, sort of what I can say is that I have read that people with PTSD and depression um, can potentially have a higher risk of, or be more susceptible to false memory implantation. Right. Yeah. That um, makes sense. But I would, but again, explaining that by saying, oh, it's because no, the no, brain no. wants to connect that. Yeah. 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 I can't I'm, I'm say that because it. Yeah, yeah. You're Yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is perfectly fine. I just can't say that's why. <laughs> so that's that, that's that sort of, that's that story. Uh, the other article was um, adults impact on the reliability and suggestibility of children's eyewitness testimony. What they did here was they showed kids a movie and um, then they gave them a questionnaire which um, had um, uh, a free narrative question and 18 open-ended questions. Um, so the free narrative question just asked them, asked the kids to specify what they remembered about the, the film. And it was an animated film. Not that that's really relevant. But okay. There you go. Um, the open-ended questions um, then were about events and characters in the film, but 12 of the um, 18 open-ended questions um were perfectly normal. You can answer those. Uh, you can answer those fine. Uh, but the other six were trick questions. They were about characters and things that weren't in the film at all. Um, and they found that even when the interview interview was directly after watching the film, kids um, were quite significantly affected by the misinformation being given to them. Oh my um, god! Yeah, as in, if you gave them that sheet, they'd be like, they'd be like, oh, an authority oh. figure. An adult's telling me. I guess it must be true, and they must have been in there somewhere. Yeah, so, I mean, based on that study, that's that's what they found. Um, and children could create a new event based on the information they receive from an adult, which is pretty, which is pretty interesting. I think. Wow. Because I mean, you can almost think of it as like learning as well. Mm. It's sim- not too dissimilar from learning, uh, in that, um, as we've said, sort of thinking and memories are run by pretty similar processes. Mm. So, an adult teaches you a lot of things as a kid. So. It makes yeah. sense that kids are going to believe what adults tell them. Um, and so now we can probably go back to Nelson Mandela and the Berenstain Bears. Um, <laughs> so I told you guys about that list, um, that sort of list study, uh, the Dees uh, the, the Rodiger McDermott paradigm, the DRM paradigm. Yeah? Yes. Where you've basically got a list of related words. And when someone tries to remember it, they can add a word into the list that wasn't initially present because yep. it's related to those words. Yes. Now, you might you might actually you know, sort of have an idea here of how the Mandela effect and the Berenstain Bears thing works. Um, yeah, parallel on... universe. Yeah, right. Okay. In the description, there is a study that is about parallel universes in relation to the Nelson Mandela effect because that came up when I was searching for it. So yeah, if you caused want... by the Large Hadron Collider, Corey. Come on, you <laughs> if know you, this. If you want to read about that and string theory, go ahead. Be my guest. <laughs> it is linked in the description. <laughs> I do, and I will. <laughs> but there's plenty of YouTube videos telling you on the internet that the Mandela effect is just to do with parallel universes. Yeah, which is which I is imagine re- you're not going to do that. No, it's really frustrating though because because false memories is so much more interesting than the boring idea of oh the world just split into a parallel universe and Ooh. then it went back together again. That makes sense, but we you guys know that out. the Large Hadron Collider caused Brexit. <laughs> Please explain how. Um, because the Large Hadron Collider created a black hole, which it was a fourth dimensional black hole, which sucked two universes in the third dimension closer together. And then our paths crossed. And um, then people from an alternative reality um, came to this reality. And then they went, ah, oh, don't like this Europe stuff that's going on. Um, and that's how. <laughs> what a Hadron wonderful Collider world you live in, Luke. What a wonderful <laughs> world. <laughs> I once in, my, in the last house I lived in, I once convinced everyone in that house to just simultaneously tweet the Large Hadron Collider caused Brexit. 
<laughs> yeah, one of my finest moments. I want to live inside that skull. <laughs> I'd, I'd take a holiday there. Living there is just. <laughs> I don't actually believe this, but my brain does like thinking of weird theories that are like, oh, how could this maybe be explained in a weird way that's more interesting than the real world? <laughs> so if we actually go back to Nelson Mandela, um, and you know, You've got the, a time machine. Cool. Yes, I do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we 1970 when he died. We used it at the end of 2020, Luke, didn't we? For our for our bloody oh, best of episode, didn't yeah. we? Right. Well, we can go Doesn't to his funeral back, in 1971 though. then, can't we? But it immediately broke afterwards and it can never be used again. Hopefully we can get it rebuilt by the end of this year. Potentially. Potentially. <laughs> or maybe it'll come up with another gimmick. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so Nelson Mandela um, and the Berenstain Bears. Now, if you think about this, um, what we know from the DRM paradigm that people can misremember things or create new memories of things uh, based on suggestion. Mm. That kind of works if you think about the Mandela effect. People remember Nelson Mandela. People remember something to do with him in prison. Mm. He must have died in prison. He's an old man and mm. that's what old men do. Yeah, They die, generally. Um, Usually. Yeah. Eventually. At some point. some point, hopefully. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, Yeah, so it's very easy to remember that it's very easy to understand how people how many people can um, have the idea of Nelson Mandela, prison, old, and kind of introduced, died in there. Because that that kind of makes sense. It, it follows, it tracks. Yeah. And the Berenstain Bears, um, the, the issue here is people think that it's spelt Berenstain, as in with an E instead of Berenstain, with an A. Mm. And Berenstain is just a much more common name than Berenstain. In fact, the creator of the Berenstain Bears, his surname is Berenstain. So... It, it, he's had that issue his entire life as well. In fact, his son, who then took over uh, running the, the you know, those bears, um, has even said, yeah, my dad's entire life, he had people saying that he was Berenstein. And even when I was in school, uh, my teacher said, oh no, it must be Berenstein, not Berenstein. And that's not, they're not even bears. They're not even, that was just their name. Yeah. So in this case, it's it's creation of false memories basically because makes as much sense as the real thing i have a similar issue with my name because people always go oh i thought your last name o'neill is yeah. spelt with two l's because that's the common spelling of o'neill but mine's actually spelt with one l yeah it is and so i have to correct people all the time they're like no i thought it was two no it's never been two it's, it's infuriating one. yeah yeah but no it's <laughs> that's an it's infuriating to write because i've always got to get rid of that second l ah, <laughs> backspace but uh, yeah, no, that's you can see here why people can collectively misremember something. And what I mentioned mm. from the start, that film with um, uh, what's he called Sinbad called Kablam, or, or that film with Sinbad called Shazam, mm. people can very easily remember that there was a film in the nineties, uh, but a genie um, called Azam or something, yeah, and it had a black guy in it whose name begins with S. Sinbad, Shaq, Shazam, Kablam. It makes sense <laughs> that you can. It makes sense that your brain wants to, like your yeah. brain wants to fill in the gaps. Yeah. It always wants to fill in the gaps. Um, and when it comes to memory, it's not any different. It's just sometimes it's not very good at filling the gaps. You yeah. Know? So yeah, it makes sense that this would happen. Um, and you know, that's, that's kind of what I was getting to as well, that false, with false memories and perception, because memories aren't infallible. Sometimes we like to think that memories are pretty good, but they're not necessarily. And that's the thing. Perception is not perfect either. In fact, um, perception is really just kind of, it, it, perception is almost an illusion that your brain creates for you mm -hmm. because the way that you're experiencing the world isn't exactly how, it's, how it is, yeah. you know, and it, your brain is filtering out tons of things and obviously the little things we've talking about with blind spots and mm -hmm. like even looking at a clock and seeing that the second hand isn't moving because your brain is basically editing all the information for mm -hmm. you. So memories themselves, even if based on, specifically on perception are still a, a good step away from reality yeah. because your perception is away from reality. So <laughs> memories being one step away from sort of initial perception doesn't, yeah, it, it's not that um, sort of unbelievable. Yeah. And it, it's, it's fairly, it, it's fairly understandable that your brain whose job it is to fill in the gaps also wants to fill in the gaps of memory. <laughs> Makes sense. So why don't we talk about some risk factors really quickly? Risk, risk factors, factors. Well, potential risk factors. Turns out, cannabis use apparently isn't one of them. Cannabis oh. use can make your memory. Um, so it, basically, in the study, they found that people um, <laughs> they tested uh, intoxicated uh, cannabis consumers 
and sober cannabis consumers, and then used people who had never consumed cannabis as a control. And um, they found that um, uh, sober cannabis users uh, falsely recognized more unrelated items than control participants, but also um, without a history, if you've never used cannabis before, um, you've probably got a better memory than people who are high, essentially. Mm -hmm. So what we can take away from this is that cannabis can affect um, false memories. In fact, if you if you um, are intoxicated with cannabis, you can um, you can falsely recognize things that you right. don't actually recognize. Do you mean hallucinate? No, 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 not hallucinate. No, as in they present something to you and say, do you remember this? And you're like, yeah. Vaguely? Oh, wow. Yeah, well, that's not ex that's not explicitly exactly what they so did. like a false positive. False positive. Yeah, like a false positive, yeah. 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 So it like, okay, the way you might do this is you give people a list of words and then um, you weigh and then you, you show them um, sort of, you, you sort of ask them to say which ones of these were in the previous list and they'll maybe tick them off and get a couple wrong, a few mm -hmm. false positives. Mm -hmm. um, um, and emotion is another, is another risk factor. So stop having emotions. Um, emotional memories can be more vivid, um, but less accurate. Like what I was saying earlier, when the amygdala gets involved, they can be very vivid memories, but not very accurate memories. So it, you can fill in the blanks. If your brain tries to fill in the blanks here, it's got more blanks to fill in. Um, and there was a particular review that basically came up, that basically after looking at lots of different studies came with the idea that um, when you've got sort of, um, when you've got emotions that are sort of um, related to sort of, basically the emotions that you experience before attaining a goal or failure, um, sort of hope and fear, those ones, uh, those narrow the scope of your attention. So you you sort of perceive less stuff. You're more focused on your goal mm. um, before you achieve or fail at it, you know? So hope and fear can like narrow your scope. Yeah. But um, the ones that come after achieving a goal or failing in a goal, sadness or happiness, those then broaden your scope of attention so you can basically pay attention to more things and uh, have a more sort of, um, accurate memory of an event. And basically what they found here was that um, you are more resistant to misinformation um, in the sort of states of happiness and sadness than you are in states of sort of fear or hope. Does that make sense, Luke? You, Luke? No, I mean, I just, I guess that means like if you're talking about misinformation, if you're in a state of fear, you're, that sounds like by extension of what you just said, if you're in a state of fear, you're more likely to be susceptible to misinformation. Mm -hmm. Um than if you're just sad or happy. Um, so if you're in a condition in life in which you are scared quite a lot of the time, um, you're more likely to pick up on um, misinformation and that misinformation might make you even more scared. And then that's just a vicious cycle of, of hoovering up nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. So you, I mean, look, basically the, uh, yeah, the idea here is that certain emotions can leave you more susceptible to creating false memories. Mm. And that can be, that can be used in, in that sense to make people Manipulate. more susceptible to misinformation. Yeah. Um, mm. Speaking of misinformation, there's actually a study that I found about um, susceptibility to false memories for COVID-19 fake news. Um, because exposure to fake news can result in false memories. Um, and horribly, obviously, that can change how you then um, act afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so th these people basically decided to do a study um, on on, on this COVID-19 misinformation and false memories because there is a, there's a lot of misinformation going, at, um, going on right now. Um, and they took a, they took a, a, a sample of people, um, 3,746 people to be exact. Um, and they, they looked at the effect of differences in knowledge about COVID-19, mm -hmm. um, engagement with the media or sort of discussion about coronavirus, and three, anxiety uh, about COVID-19, and four, analytical reasoning. So um, what's interesting, apparently, is that um, objectively and subjectively assessed knowledge about COVID-19 were not necessarily correlated. So people, what that means is basically people that said they knew a lot about COVID-19 mm. didn't necessarily know a lot about COVID-19. Ah. You know, it's people who think, oh yeah, I've got a, I've got a solid grasp of this. Probably, not probably, but may not actually have a solid grasp yeah. of it. Which what's is that called again? Dunning-Kruger effect. Dunning-Kruger effect. It. Yeah. Yeah, it's which the is that goes like, it haunts me. Yes. The Dunning Kruger <laughs> effect, uh, basically the idea that people who are less competent in something have much more confidence about their competence than those yeah. who who almost have the highest amount of confidence in that field. Yeah, and it terrifies me. Despite knowing me. the least, 
every single day. I'm like, yeah. do I know this thing or do I just think I know this thing? <laughs> so people that um people that objectively had more knowledge about COVID nineteen, so mm. they 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 looked into it and they knew more about COVID nineteen. Yeah. Um, that had an association with fewer false memories but more true memories. So if you know more about COVID nineteen, you're gonna you're gonna be less susceptible to the misinformation. Um, and better at retaining correct information, which makes sense. We'd mm -hmm. expect that. Um, and we'd hope that'd be the case for all of our listeners. Uh, <laughs> um, um, but uh, sort of, uh, on the other hand, uh, people who just thought that they were very knowledgeable about it, but weren't actually very knowledgeable about it, mm -hmm. um, were more likely to report memory for true stories, but they didn't have a reduction in false memories. So they were kind of at the baseline average level for false memories, uh. um, uh, but had sort of more true memories. So not as good as being someone who actually has knowledge about it uh, because they still have a lot of false memories, but they are they do have more true memories than someone that, um, say, isn't um, knowledgeable about it or doesn't think that they're knowledgeable about it. Uh. Um, and people who had high levels of media engagement or anxiety about COVID-19 had an increase uh, in true memories, but not an increase in false memories necessarily. So... Um, <laughs> so and also um, higher levels of analytical reasoning uh, meant that you had uh, fewer memories for both true and fabricated stories uh, so that meant that basically um, the people that were better at analytical reasoning probably had a sort of stricter threshold mm -hmm. for reporting a memory for any story Yeah, and so that shows that false memories can form in response to fake COVID-19 news and that susceptibility to that um, is affected by how much you know about COVID-19 and how you interact with COVID-19 information, uh, as well as whether or like, how well you are, how good you are at thinking critically. Mm -hmm. So effectively, what you could take away from this is that um, people that think they know a lot about COVID-19 um, are about as are susceptible to misinformation, uh, more so than people that actually know more about COVID-19, yeah. um, or be, even just people that are anxious about it or engage with it a lot in the media. Mm. Yeah, so make sure you know what you're talking about. Or you're going to be, uh, you could be misinformed. Um, sleep deprivation can also increase um, your susceptibility to false memories. And I just want to briefly, before we finish, talk about um, witness testimony and other issues and how it affects that. Because obviously this is a really interesting thing. It's a, it's a bit fun. It may be a little bit freaky that you can sort of remember things that didn't actually happen. Mm. But it can have actual, awful real world implications. So, um, you know, you can have people confess for um, things that they didn't do when mm. under intense interrogation, intense, intense interrogation. Yeah. So you can um, <laughs> you can admit to murder without ever having committed a murder yeah. because someone is interrogating you and you end up sort of remembering that you did it potentially. Um, and I think this is kind of similar to how people that if you lie a lot, you can start believing your own lies. Mm. Um, mm. Because if you just go over that and again, again and again. Is that what's called pathological liars? Pathological liars. Yeah. yeah. So neuroscientists, they looked at... So the thing is that there's no way to tell um, whether someone is um, talking about a false memory mm -hmm. or an actual memory when you're just talking to them. You can't yeah. tell from from normal perception. Yes, I've seen it. I've heard it shows up on MRI scans the same, does it not? Well, no, no, it doesn't actually. So if you if you look at... If, well, if, you, um, if, you, if you take a brain scan... Um, and there is there is a slight difference. So there is a study um, from a university in South Korea. Um, it okay. So it was a small sample size, but they did notice a difference. It was a very small sample size, actually. Um, it was eleven people, but they were able to spot a difference. So I don't know if that um, how well that has been replicated, but there is some evidence to suggest that you can tell the difference um, using brain scans because it's it, it'd be different areas of the brain. So um, when they used um, FMRI, uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, uh, they found changes in blood flow to different areas of the brain. So um, when it's basically about confidence um, in your answer. So when people were confident that their answers were correct, when mm -hmm. people were confident and their answers were correct, uh, blood flow increased to the hippocampus, um, which, as we know, is the part that you use ah, to store memory. Yeah. Um, and if they were confident in their answer but wrong, which happened about 20% of the time, um, it was a different part of the brain that lit up. Um, the a part of the brain that's associated with a sense of familiarity, oh, which kind of falls in with that sort of that's um, so cool. the sort of uh, fuzzy image idea, yeah. uh, that sort of theory. So people can people can be say they're confident about something but be wrong about it yeah. because they've got a gist of it, and this yeah. kind of falls into the idea that 
your conscious mind, you're not necessarily fully aware of a lot of the stuff that's going on below the surface, mm. which is really interesting. And that can like sort of aid in the creation of false memories. Yeah. So you, you could potentially tell the difference if, um, if someone isn't sort of, if it's coming from that area of the brain, but if, <laughs> but if it's not coming from that area of the brain, we don't know if that's where all sort of false memories, um, sort of may light up. Um, it would be very difficult to tell them apart. Mm. So yeah, there's, there's there's lots of different things that can cause people to um, there's there's lots of different ways that this this can be sort of utilized um, in witness testimony and getting people to confess for crimes. You know, to sort of almost um, pervert the course of justice because if you lead someone if you lead someone to an answer, they can fully believe that that is that that is what's happening. So it's something that is it's kind of a it's kind of a worry that you need to be very careful about how you ask questions and how you interrogate people especially with children because children you can lead children into answering something um, yeah. that isn't true and fully believing it like i think south park did a fantastic hilarious bit on this about something that is very very horrible basically um people were asking the kids questions about what had happened to them and the questions were so leading that the kids were like oh did it happen mm. i guess it must have um, and the, the thing is that that actually kind of happens in real life almost. And the issue here is that knowing about it doesn't remove the effect. Like being fully aware that this is something that happens, um, can maybe make you slightly, um, more sort of aware of it, but it doesn't completely remove it. Mm. So th we, we're not really sure necessarily what we can do about this, but we are aware that it exists. And I think it's something that's really interesting and it really kind of sheds a new light on how memory works and how we perceive the world. Yeah. I have a story on that. I met a man when I was in high school. I met a man called John Button who was sent to prison for a very long time mm -hmm. for killing his girlfriend when he didn't actually kill his girlfriend. Someone else ran her over. He wasn't even there. He was nowhere near. And he was uh, convicted because he was interrogated for a long time by the police and the tactics they used got a confession, uh, confession out of him. And it was that confession that sent him to prison for a long time. And it was only after he got out of prison that he worked with a researcher and a sort of a mm. investigative journalist, I guess. And they compiled the evidence and he got exonerated eventually, but he served his full sentence and he was sent to prison for that, sentence. for that whole time. Never did it. That is ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a perfect example of exactly yeah. what can happen, especially when we're not careful about how we go about things because it, it is, it can be incredibly easy to lead people into thing, into believing things that aren't true just by simple suggestion um, here and there. There's obviously different levels of it, as we've said, like injecting a word into a list that wasn't actually there up to completely fabricating a memory of mm. a life event that just never happened. And I think it's really interesting. And to get back to the sort of Mandela effect and how that happens, I think it's much more interesting than um, a parallel universe converging. That uh, yeah. Our memory is just um is just not as sort of perfect as we thought it is as, as we sort of think it is you know very flawed very flawed more flawed than is comfortable yes yeah you got anything to say luke no very good <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, that is the show for this week but before we go we've got something very special to do don't we yes we do we've got to thank all of our new patrons we do who have signed up in the last month yeah signed up in the last month but before we thank all of those we'd like to give a very special thank you to our executive producer ashley muller thank you ashley yeah, thank you ashley oh looks oh he's gone for continually supporting the show oh luke's back hello, hello back. i was getting hello, my luke. phone to read all the names we were just thanking ashley our executive producer ah oh, ashley how's the bread going she, she can't hear she me. can't hear you no. <laughs> No, she well, can't hear, hear you. Her. You I can't hear her. Actually, I want you to reply even though I can't hear you. <laughs> oh, guys, shh, don't interrupt her. It's going well. Very good, Ashley. Oh. Thank you very much. For <laughs> I was like, I could hear her. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to be thanked in next month's Patreon vote episode, you can be. All you need to do is sign up to patreon.com forward slash sci guys uh, for any amount and you can be thanked by us next month but mm. first let's thank all of our lovely patrons thank you to holly butler thank you to mac thompson thank you Liv Shu. thank you seb stevenson thank you to marion l thank you tom duchamp thank you to emily cota thank you to ashley adams thank you clara rose <laughs> thank you zayren productions thank you to kiana dillard thank you simone name my granny seagull 
Thank you to Andrea Held. Thank you to Darby Latting. Thank you, Lilo. Thank you, Elias Blad. Thank you to Dami Campbell. Thank you, Tim Henning. What was Tim Henning? It might be Tim. Tim, Tim Henning? Tim Henman? Tim. Thank you, Tim Henman. Thank you to Deadly Melody 27. Thank you to Francesca Blythe. Thank you, Alice Roxburgh. Thank you, Anna Hera Chesham. Thank you to Eloise Brewster. Thank you, Lily CB. Thank you, Zeus. Zeus. Suzanne. <laughs> Suzanne. Suzanne Thele. Thele. Thank you, Suzanne. Suzanne Thele. I like that. I'm so sorry if I get this wrong. It's, it's, so it sounds like it sounds like the name of a bacteria. Ooh, yeah, it's very cool. I like it. Patent it. Thank, I'm so sorry if well, I get it this wrong. Affects animals. Thank you to Ike. I Thank you, Libby name. Davidson. Thank you, Nadine C. Hooray! Hooray! Nadine Coyle from from the from from the Girls Aloud is our patron. Is that I don't know the members of Girls Aloud, Corey. I'm sorry. I only know her because she's big I on TikTok. I forgot Girls Aloud are a group. <laughs> no, but thank you to all of our patrons, and we're terribly sorry to all of the names that we butchered. <laughs> but if you want to have your name butchered, uh, just like those, <laughs> just like those it's lovely people, it's one of our perks. <laughs> <laughs> just like those lovely people, uh, again, head on over to side. <laughs> to patreon.com forward slash side guys uh, and join up there. You get loads of cool stuff, don't you? What do they get, guys? You can get some fancy bonus episodes every single month. Hell yeah. You can get access to the Patreon Discord. Very you nice. Side guys Discord. You can also get access to every single side guys alive. You can. Mm -hmm. Very and nice. And some bonus clips. And some bonus clips. You can vote in the polls. We do polls every month. You can suggest episode topics. Yeah. Yeah, it's loads of stuff, actually. Loads of stuff, honestly. There's too much stuff. Too much. Yeah. No, just enough, I think. Yeah. The perfect amount. And, <laughs> and also, if you sign up, you know, to be a patron, you can also uh, get us to 250, at which point we'll make a full episode of Psy Guys, but with rats instead of the Psy Guys. And like, you know you want to see it. I like that we're sticking to that promise. Yeah, we're sticking to it. Yeah. We're sticking to this because I want to see it. Of course. Get us there. Go on. I want to buy the little rat microphone. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will if we get to 250 patrons. A single use item. What a great <laughs> what a great business decision. Not if we hire some mice to co-host sometimes. <laughs> if I want to take a break. If you want to take or a if, break. If, if I'm speaking particularly shrill one day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for watching. You can find full references for this episode in the description. Subscribe for new episodes every Sunday and why not leave us a nice week comment? You can support the pod at patreon.com forward slash SciGuys or you can find and contact us at SciGuysPod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube and now TikTok too. Or you can send us an email at SciGuysPod at gmail.com. I am not Corey everywhere. I'm Jamkin everywhere. I'm Luke Cutforth everywhere. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye.